makes me want to break dance. So if does anybody have a cardboard box? He turned it back on so I could actually do it. Can I just say, if you're watching online, you're probably missing out a little bit because it's so much better here. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, though, if you don't have a prayer to pray, just thank God that you don't have to see Pastor Tim breakdance because uh, that is a blessing from God. Well, here we are in week number three of this series we're calling Trauma, and uh, man, it, it's been a great couple of weeks. I think that you all would agree with me. I continue to hear and even see on Facebook, maybe you're seeing these comments come through of how people are saying, man, this series came at the right time for me. This series is speaking to me. This, ser this series is ministering to me, and, uh, and we've got people that are coming forward even saying, hey, I've had this traumatic experience in my past, and because of this series, I want to be able to share my testimony publicly. It's amazing. It's amazing how this series on trauma is really uh, touching people's lives in a deep way. So I'm looking forward to, to bringing forward some, some more of those comments and testimonies to share with you. God is up to something, and I'm excited to be along on that journey. Today, uh, in, in uh, uh, week number three of this, uh, I want to introduce to you our guest speaker. Since the mid-1980s, Mike has combined ministry and counseling for families, couples, and individuals of all ages using his life experiences to inform the guidance he provides. For example, having experienced the changes and challenges a marriage endures across decades, he's able to walk couples through the changes needed to remain faithful in a culture that tends to overvalue uh, relational intimacy and undervalue marriage. While he's worked with families, couples, and individuals of all ages, Mike has a particular interest in helping people who have experienced complex developmental trauma, such as adoptive families and those who are currently in foster care. He also enjoys working with men who grapple with addictive thinking and behaviors, anxiety and depression, as well as younger men who struggle to reconcile their life experiences with their faith. Mike also enjoys counseling church leaders, which is where uh, I first met him. He put on a seminar for church leaders, and I was able to attend that, and he did a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Uh, I walked away with so many rich pieces of information that helped me tremendously. Uh, Mike received his bachelor's degree from Anderson University, went on to receive a master's degree in counseling from Biblical Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. Mike worked with a group of churches to open a counseling center, helping with communication challenges, depression, anger, anxiety, parenting skills, addiction, and OCD. In 2013, after adopting two children, Mike received training from Texas Christian University in trust-based relational intervention. He is a certified TBRI practitioner an educator, and a prepare and enrich marriage facilitator. Mike and his wife, Kathy, who are with, who's with us today, uh, were, were college sweethearts who married in 1984. They have five children, uh, and the couple helped to plant a church in the Irvington area of Indianapolis where Mike serves as an elder and works with the men's ministry and the advocate team for Community Care Groups Church. Can you join me in welcoming Mike Spencer to the platform today? to bring up coffee because water just isn't enough to cut the, you know, stuff that builds up in your mouth while you're talking. So, um, you know, I, uh, I love that uh, Admiral Stockdale quote that Tim talked about last week. Um, I actually heard him in an interview. Uh, I haven't, haven't read the book. I've heard it's a great book, but I haven't read it. But it was phenomenal, and it's... Uh, challenged me so much, even in, my, in ministry and counseling, with how, the significance of hope, how hope is so important. And, and uh, I also have discovered, you know, how easy it is to lose hope, right? Um, you do things, you work hard, uh, and, and then a challenge comes out of the blue that you unexpected, like uh, you trim your child's favorite climbing tree, and it you have unexpected results when you destroy their favorite tree and you take off all of their favorite climbing limbs and suddenly, strangely enough, I found myself like just devastated with that loss of hope for me because it seems like it's so easy to make, to do, to make the wrong mistake and, and it's like it's a very simple thing. What happened? How did that happen? 
How did, how did, I, how did that work, right? You, do, you, try, you, you try hard. It's, it's easy to get yourself focused on the way you want things to go, how you want to experience things, and, and forget you're in a story, right? And the, the end of the story is something that turns into something you can't imagine. And so I want to go to our uh, first slide here and um, just put this before you, right? How we never, you know, it's important never to lose faith, but also to know this, you're going to at times. And so you have to find ways to be drawn back, right? You have to have anchors in your life. And I would say for me, and maybe for many of you, this is an anchor for me, right? Gathering together with the people of God to worship is an anchor, right? And it points me to something new, right? It points me that, that, the, that the hope is in Jesus, right? Because Jesus is busy about changing things, right? He's moving things forward. And you can go to the next slide. To where right now in this world, right, in Jesus, there is and there will be a great reversal. It is coming. It is happening now. And as we engage with people in trauma, we are part of that great reversal moving forward, right? And so I pointing to a particular passage in Luke 16 that brings and demonstrates that reversal. Uh, so let me go ahead and read that now. Um, and I need to bring it up on my screen so I can see it. So who's he talking to? The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all of these things, and they ridiculed him. And, said, and he said to them, you are those who justify themselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one dot of the law to become void. And so that's who he's talking to. Now let's go into the passage here of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham. Now, I hope you don't get that song in your mind right now, right? And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the, fing the end of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, Remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So here is this moment when you see a clarity that the way things are are going to be changed. Right? So it's moving forward into a future that may be a bit hard to grasp as he describes it there. But I want you to think about this. The first thing we see is there's this description of a reversal there of his wealth and resources. 
right? And I want to ask you this question as we talk, right? Because I'm going to go into some pretty specifics about what do we do to help those with trauma? How do we engage with them? What kind of things do they need? And so I want you to consider now that, you know what, talking about trauma and actually engaging with people with trauma, you're going to have to change your life, right? And I want you to, in so, in so doing, I want you to understand that um, this is what God has intended, right? Because we have this question, right? How did actually Jesus use his resources and his wealth to serve us? Well, we find out in Philippians 2, he gave it all up, right? So we're going to find ourselves engaging with people with trauma that is inconvenient, time-consuming, and it's hard. But it won't cost you your life. But giving yourself to the uh, being the rich man will cost you your life. So let me jump back to that passage briefly, just to begin before we get into some specifics. And I drink a little coffee. Now, let me be clear. This is not about an issue of just being rich. And the passage shows us that, right? Where, how does it show us? Right there in verse 19, it says, the rich man was clothed in purple and, and fine linen. It's sort of like, you know, he, uh, had, he liked nice pants, and he, he dressed in silk, right? It's, it's this emphasis, right? And he, he feasted sumptuously every day. You know, he lived for his riches, right? That's what his life was all about, right? And so at the end of it, he has lived this way, and what do we find? We find that he's, he's now all just what he longed for, what he desired, and that is all he is, a rich man. And so if we let ourselves get caught up in not giving away our, uh, our concern about our resources and pull back from the people who need us, we will find that um, we will have lost our humanity and we will have lost our ability to enjoy the gospel and its peace. So I want you to kind of think about um, actually changing how you consider. So this, um, this word in there, it's when it says it's being in torment, that's a, it's a, it's a, a Greek word, um, basonos, and it refers to a stone that is rubbed against rare metals to reveal whether or not it's true, right? And so the rich man is being revealed as just that. Uh, he has nothing more. So I want us to consider that in the coming kingdom, you know, this wealth that the rich man has and a name that Lazarus had are not connected, right? Wealth and a name are not connected in the coming kingdom. So I want you to say the name of the person that you first think of when I, tell, when I uh, say the name of these companies, okay? Name me the first person you think of that comes to mind. Tesla. Okay. Amazon. Okay. Facebook. Right. Walmart. 29 years dead, and we know his name, right? 29 years, and we know his name. Because in this world, wealth gives you a name. But in the coming kingdom, it will not. Jesus gives us the name. So let me step forward into thinking about, well, how does trauma happen, right? What, what does it look like? So let's start with, so I'm going from high level to like, right down here on the floor, where the rubber meets the road. So what happens when a child uh, is born, right? They cry. They cry for food. They cry for touch. <clears throat> Pardon me, touch. They, try, they cry when they, need to, when they need to sleep. They cry when they need comforting, when they need food or changed. And what, what do parents do? 
they respond by meeting those needs. But what happens when they don't? And so I want you to go to the next slide, and this gives you a little bit of a picture of how it starts out for an infant, right? They're in distress, they, they have needs, and their sympathetic nervous system ramps up, and their excitatory neurotransmitters ramp up, and no one meets them. You know, in Romania, there was, you know, a big issue a few years back in all the orphanage, and you would go into those orphanage, and you would find it quiet which is strange, right? You would think they'd all be crying, but they learned there was no one to meet their needs. And so they gave up. Now here's, here's the difficulty with that. It seems like those babies are calm, but they're not. Their automatic nervous system is up. Their excitatory neurotransmitter levels are up, right? What does that mean? Well, it means lots of chronic disease, inflammation, it means reactivity to every little stre to stresses. It's very bad for us to be under constant stress. And so what it, what it looks like for these kids is that they're always stuck in this place of survival because there is no one else to take care of them but themselves. Now that just doesn't just happen in orphanages, right? It happens all over the place. It happens with parents who are addicted, whether it's drugs or whether it's, um, you know, they're, they're at home and they're drinking all the time, it, they're alcoholics. Um, so these kids are faced with a reactive system. Well, what does that mean for you, right? I'll, I'll, you know, it, it means that they can get very upset at very small things. You know, if, you're, if you want to bring children in with trauma, you have to understand how are you going to care for them because it won't work to do it with the way you've done it with other, other children, with your own children. Why is that? Because your own children have a bond with you. They're attached to you, right? And these children look at you as an adult, and adults, generally speaking, for, for people with trauma, are not safe, right? They don't they know, they have experienced that people are not out for their good. So their, their nervous system is already on guard. Well, what does that mean? All right, let me take a drink of coffee and then I'll tell you. It means that um, their, your amygdala has this job. So this is their brain, right? Here's your brain stem. Here's the lower brain, the non-thinking, feeling brain. Up here is the, th the thinking brain, all right? So if this is your amygdala, one of its jobs is to scan your environment for risk, right? For potential risk. You don't even know it's doing it. But it does it when you're at rest, when you're calm 40 times a minute. It's taking in all the data. It says, okay, who, is there somebody by the door? Where can I get out? It's just, and you're not thinking about it, right? That's just you when you're sitting here now. But if you're stressed, right? These kiddos, it's happening four times a second. Four times a second, their, their, their brain is evaluating whether or not it's safe, right? So if they come to an environment and it starts to get, and it's too loud for them, they, they flip out. They get angry or they just fall on the floor, right? Some different reactions that you're going to see when that happens. And so they're on alert, right? And what happens then is if they're already stressed, you know, and it kicks up, just a little bit, then boop, they flip their lid. Now, why, why does that matter, okay? Because this is your thinking part of your brain. This is the brain, the part of the brain that think is about moral reasoning, right? Right or wrong, it's about what, it, it predicts consequences for behavior. If I do this, this is going to happen, right? If I take this half of my peanut butter sandwich and smash it in my brother's face, what will my mom do, right? Won't be good. Um, it's that, so what happens is when, when the amygdala takes over your brain, it literally does, the, it, you flip your lid, right? And so now, all moral reasoning, all ability to, to predict consequences is lost, right? The brain is now, because uh, it's suppressing logical thought and reasoning, 
you get reactions you don't, ex don't expect. So you need, so the first, when working with uh, children and adults, and, a ch and someone is upset, the first thing you look towards is, how do I help this person get to calm, right? Why? Because when they're like this, right, they're in survival, and they have three choices as how to live. Either fight, or run away, right, flight, or freeze, right? Boom. You do fight or flight when you have some hope of winning, right? You fight when you have some hope, or you run when you have some hope of get away. But then if you lose hope, and there's no ability to, to get away, you go boom to freeze. That's what the body does. And they have no choice at that moment. So you can't help a person or a child do anything. You can't reason with them until we get this, right? We got to get their body to calm, right? And I want to show you uh, next so the actual sort of like physiologically what that kind of look can look like in the brain, all right? So that's PTSD, right? That's, there's different ways to get there. That's not a complex developmental trauma. That's usually considered with an, a, uh, an incident, but, but um, with PTS, with complex, it's multiple incidents of trauma with multiple kinds of trauma. So what you see there is what happens to the brain when it's under constant stress, right? Shrinks down, memory issues, um, lots of things happening there. I just want you to know that we, there's real physical science behind that, right? And you can see, oh my, we have a brain that's not functioning well. So you could say this, right? Physical, or let's say, uh, relational trauma causes literal physical trauma to people, right? So that, that's, that's neglect, right? That's the child who is left most of the time in the, in the, uh, in the uh, crib, only touched when it's time, occasionally to change the diaper, occasionally fed, right? That's that even neglect, right? Not active harm. Now, I understand neglect is harm, right? But even neglect results in that. Not being mistreated, just not being treated well has the same result, often worse. So what are some of those symptoms? What, some, what does it look like, right? Some developmental traumas, so sensory problems. So let's talk, let's pause for just a second. Why would that be? I was hoping somebody would have a baby, but you hold the baby, you look in its eyes, and as you're looking into that baby's eyes, because you're doing that, there are neural, there are neural pathways growing in that baby's brain just because you look in their eyes. And those neural pathways do not develop if no one's looking in their eyes, right? When you talk to that baby, right, and you sweetly say its name and coo, there are neural pathways just because it hears your voice that grow. And they don't grow if that doesn't happen. Imagine the rooms that are in your house where, like, if you didn't turn the light switch on and off often enough, that the wiring would just go away. Wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> you know, imagine. So, um, sensory. So, if sound isn't coming, if they're not seeing, if they're not being touched, right? When they're being touched, neural pathways are growing. And if they're not being touched, they don't grow. So there's literal damage that takes place, developmental damage. And as I've said, so the, it, there's an insecurity of attachment. And like, what's, what does that mean? Well, that means I either say, um, you know what, it's too hard. And I rather would preoccupy myself with things, right? They learn to say, hey, attachment is dangerous. I would rather focus my attention on stuff and, and stay away from people or it results in a preoccupation with people, right? Always thinking about people, what they're thinking about me, right? Well, what does that look like? Well, what that looks like is one of my daughters, if I praise her, 
right? The other one freaks out and thinks, well, you, you, if, you, if you're praising her, you must not like me, right? Because I only know that I'm secure if you're saying good things to me. And now you might prefer her over me, right? That's what it looks like. And behavioral dysregulation, fancy word of saying they can't control their emotions. They go up and down all over the place. So let me go to the next slide. What can we do? We drink coffee. You have to be careful not to drink too much or I'll, I'll start vibrating. <laughs> so we have to really start at some basics through you know, physiological res regulation. Now this, this is not maybe as important to you um, if you haven't gone through trauma, but here's the deal. These things, sleep, hydration, blood sugar levels, sensory needs are incredibly important because the, the brain development hasn't happened. Um, so let's just talk about blood sugar first. Blood sugar goes down, cortisol goes up. Cortisol is a stress hormone, right? So what that means is a child who is here in his automatic nervous system is ramped up just because they're thirsty they ramp up, right? Because their cortisol goes and they boom, they blow up, they, they lose it, right? Just because they haven't eaten, right? Do you get grumpy when you haven't eaten? Yeah, right. And so for those kids, it's not, it's, uh, it's not just that I'm grumpy, it's I'm at risk. I'm at risk. Somebody, somebody was, something bad is going to happen. That's what their body is saying, and so they act that way, Right? Same thing's true with hydration. Got to keep, got to keep the water. Got to keep hydrated for those kiddos. So what am I saying is, for children or even adults who've gone through trauma, make sure you're eating every couple of hours. Make sure you're drinking lots of water, lots of liquids, getting that in to help your body handle the stress that it's under. Okay, it's absolutely necessary. And then sort of this idea of figuring out how you can sleep, right? Because for many kids, lots of bad things happen when they were asleep. Parents fighting. Waking up and finding out there aren't any parents in the house. Um, all kinds of things. And so it can be difficult to get that place of sleep, but finding routine, finding ways to bring comfort and safety. So we're going to jump to the environmental regulation, right, and to how to help. And that's felt safety, right? I can tell my kids all I want that they're safe. They don't feel it, <laughs> just doesn't matter. They've got, so working on that felt safety, right? Working on that, and we'll, we'll move forward of like what, what, that, what that looks like a little bit more. Scaffolding means kind of supporting. So if I say, hey, hey buddy, you need to sit still here, it might mean, hey, I'm gonna come over and actually help him, right? Support him physically by helping him be still. Um, daily rituals, meaning making things predictable. Right? So for your kids, for yourself, make things predictable. Give lots of warnings. So this is the stuff right here on the ground. It's not exciting, right? It's just the stuff you have to do every day. Transitions. So the brain doesn't like it to shift because of what's happened to it. It's hard to get it out of one place into the next. Um, because if they're settled there, they don't want to change it. They don't want it to move. They don't want it to, to take, be taken from them. So transitions means reminding them of what's coming up, helping them think about. So if you, you know, people with trauma, oftentimes they really want to know what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen tomorrow, right, when I go to bed, what, what, what's happening. Now, that's not always with trauma, but that's a very real thing, being able to help them move from this then to this. So let's talk about our nest. So we have this, a great reversal, right, in resources, right? We're taking our resources not for ourselves, not for wealth, not just for pleasure. And by the way, it's really good to enjoy it, right? It's a gift from God. It's a blessing from God. But he means it for you to take it and bless other people with it, right? Now let's talk about this more about this transition, uh, this reversal of status and name that happens. So in this, in this go back to the... Um, Verse 24 here of uh, Luke 16. 
And he called out, Father Abraham. And there's that song again. Um, now, Father Abraham means this is a man who was a covenant participant in the Jewish community. He would never otherwise call him Father, right? And that's, that is, um, how do I say, confirmed by Abraham's response to my child, my child. And he says, so here is this rich man. He says, hey, hey, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, right? So even in torment, he's still wanting Lazarus to be his errand boy. Right? He's not able to let go of the old order, the old way of thinking about things, the old way of doing things. He's still wanting to order him around. He still thinks he's above Lazarus. There are a lot of people that you will meet who have gone through trauma, and if you're not careful, you'll think you're above them. Right? This week, my wife was in a store. Um, she's by one of those that just seems to get people to talk to her. Uh, you're like, I'm so busy trying to just get out, and and literally this happened. She she meets, you know, she looks at the checkout person in the eye. They feel comfortable, they feel safe, and she says, "How was your day?" And they say things like, "My husband just left me." That doesn't happen to me. <laughs> so I was expecting another one of those stories when she said to this, she when she said she was in a in a um, aisle, and she looked at this guy who seemed a little out of sorts, and he said to her, if you look at me that way again, that way again I'm going to kill you. Right? Right. That's kind of scary. Somebody who needs help. Right? Right. Actually, he needed that smile from my wife. Right? <laughs> so what I'm saying is, you know what? You're going you're gonna to think you're above people like that. I, I kind of, as her husband, I know. Uh, you can imagine the thoughts I had. Um, but don't imagine too much. Uh, but you can, you, it's so easy to think that. When people have needs. There's something wrong there, right? So here he, here he is. We have to find ourselves not living in the old order, but in the new one, right? The reversal that in Jesus is happening now and will completely in the future. The great reversal. So it says, uh, Abraham, send Lazarus to be my errand boy. And Abraham says, hey, the time has passed for that. And I will say to you now, the time has passed for that, even now. The time has passed for that. Who do you have power over, by the way? Your father, your mother? You have kids, right? Who does the oldest kid have over, power over, right? Who, does, who do we have power over? How do we think about them? How do we treat them? What do we do with our power? What do we do with our power? And you know, there are times that I will say to my kids, hey, I want you to empty the dishwasher. And they'll say, hey, can we do it later? And I will say to them, I'll give you five minutes, but the truth is I want it emptied because I can't stop thinking about it. So I want you to empty it for me. I want you to get it done. I give them a little time, right? I give them a little time to do it, but it really is for me, for them to get it done. And so not that we can't ask our kids to be quiet or something, but I want you to think about what do you do with your power? Let's go to that next slide for me. How do we live as persons who are free from the need to achieve, to be rich, right? How do we live as people free from the need to achieve, maintain, or exert our status? Well, how did Jesus do that, right? All right, so let's move into some of the nuts and bolts. All right. We've got to be thinking about what's happening to us, right? when we engage with people. What's happening inside of me? What happened inside of me on Friday when I cut down, had the tree trimmed and my kids freaked out? Well, my status of being a good dad was threatened, right? 
because they were so upset. My status. Well, so I need to know, like, I'm reacting to them. What am I doing here? Well, my status is in the wrong place, right? I need to use my power to comfort them. I didn't do a great job at that. I did terrible at that, actually. I need to be thinking about what's going on. My daughter asked me a very simple question one night before bed. Can we watch another show, Dad? I about flipped out. Why? I will tell you, two weeks earlier, well, actually it was less than that now. It was a week earlier, my sister had committed suicide. Inside, I just wanted them to go to bed. Just wanted a break. Because it's so stinking hard. Got Do I take that out on her, right? Do I blame her for asking, can we watch another show? It's like we, okay, now they ask every night. So it's not, it, wasn't, it wasn't new, right? That night, that night, ugh, it just welled up in me, right? You have to know what's going on in here. You can't blame other people for how you're feeling, right? You got you to be here. So when you're doing that, then you have to be mindful in the way you engage with people, right? You're aware of your past, but then you think about, well, how, how are they experiencing me, right? So some of the strategies we use when we engage with people are like what I've listed here as far as attunement. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you get in a pool with a child who's really scared to, in the water, you do all kinds of comforting things to help their fear go, go down, and when, that, when their fear subsides, you change how you act with that confidence and help them. You attune to where they are, afraid or confident. How do they feel, right? And so with, with people, with kids, it may feel like, or who have been uh, people who have gone through trauma, it may feel like, well, the last thing you want to do is touch. No, that's not the case. You want to have nurturing touch, touch that's gentle, touch that's thoughtful, right? Um, and so in many ways, though, when... Like, I run a camp where we work with kids like this, and so we're asking permission, right? May I touch you, right? How are you doing, right? So we want to, when we engage with people, we want to have warm eyes. I can be very serious. That's why I don't think cashiers talk to me, right? I'm thinking about something or, you know, I'm, I probably look crazy. You know, but, um, I'm very serious. And then we, th so we have to warm up, warm up your eyes. Look in the mirror, Right? Look in the mirror before you want to talk to one of your kids, right? Look in that mirror and see what you see. What you see. Is it scary? Right? Is it really your eyes, you know, piercing? Do you have piercing eyes? Um, warm them up. Warm up, that, warm up those eyes. Your voice quality. So with, with people with trauma, when there's tension, right, slow down your cadence. Talk a little, a little slower. Go into the lower register of your voice, right? Because that's a less threatening tone. Um, people with trauma will get freaked out because when you're talking to them, you sound like you're, um, you sound, in a sense, you talk too fast, so it feels threatening, and it feels overwhelming, or your register goes up. And that is a sense for them that you are out of control, right? If your tone, your frequency of voice goes up, then it sounds like to them you're not, you're not in control of yourself, right? Slow, lower registered voice. When you're talking to people, bring it down, slow it down so they don't feel overwhelmed. And, you, and they feel as though you're, act, you're listening to them, right? Playful engagement is so important and so very hard when I first wake up in the morning, right? That's also when my, my children are most likely to fight or to have conflict, first thing in the morning. So it's very challenging, right, having that playful. So sometimes when they're having a hard time, it's just a matter of, hey, uh, can you say that again in a nicer way? I mean, and try to be playful as you say it. Now, here's the problem. In the morning, when I'm not in a good mood, when I'm sounding playful, it sounds sarcastic. <laughs> the 
but playfulness. Um, my oldest children could take a seriousness because we had a close connection. They believed I had their best, right? Well, our younger, they don't know that. They haven't had that time with me. They haven't had that attachment that's there, and they, and so serious, it's like, so, so if I could say to my older kids, hey, don't you do that again, you know, don't you do that again, right? I try, I'm having a hard time getting serious enough, but, but with, with them, it's, wow, I, they need, oh, hey, that's not a good idea, right? They need much more playfulness, much more, because they don't have that natural sense of, oh, I can trust my dad, he'd never hurt me, right? They don't have that. So let's go to our last passage here. We'll wrap it up. So the rich man, he says, Then I beg you, Father, to send him, he's still trying to boss Lazarus around, to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The Pharisees were in a position of which they had the approval of the people and sought the approval of the people, right? And so Jesus is, is saying to the Pharisees, you know, look, Listen to God's word, right? Listen to the truth. Don't shape it. Don't stand over the word. Receive it. Receive it. Receive wisdom. Well, there are a lot of people in our world, we call them influencers, right, in, you know, Facebook or all these different ways. And they're going to influence you all kinds of ways. And if they can hook you, right? If they can hook you for, to, to, to achieve a status, if they can hook you to achieve a name or wealth, something that would seem more important, more valuable, they will. But I'm here to tell you and ask you, open your heart to the Word of God. Open your heart that there would be this reversal. Um, one more thing, because I know we're about out of time. And we'll just go to this one slide with regard to the reversal of wisdom. How do we live as persons who are willing to receive the words of the Lord? And I want you really to consider that, right? So we, we can't just say, okay, I'm not going to like indulge in, in wealth and make that my life all about that, right? I'm not going to just indulge in status and make my life all about that. What are we going to listen to? What are we going to receive, Right? And so I want you to think at this point, right, are you willing? And how did Jesus bring his wisdom into your life and bring that wisdom into those you engage with? So I just want to go through just a couple quick things in this idea of in guiding people, we want to be those who first sort of catch it low. Now, what am I doing? I'm trying to give you alternate strategies to sort of a way of dealing with people or children that's, in one sense, very kind of around what I need, right? And so I don't, I don't want to go to my kids and mess with them until it's quiet or until it's calm, right? So we want to do some things. I want to particularly, if you ask your kids to, um, like, do a redo, if you ask, hey, let's try that again, right? When I said before, hey, let's try that again and do it the right way. Then we can move them, as opposed to saying, everything has to have a consequence, right? Instead of like, okay, we're going to consequence that behavior, what we're going to do is actually have you do it the right way, right? And not in such a way that it humiliates them. All right, so let me stop there, because I can't wait to see the, sing the next song, and I'll let uh, Tim take it over from here. Thank you so much, Mike. Can we show Mike our appreciation this morning? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, JD, if you guys want to come back up here, um, you know what what struck me in in uh, number one. I don't know about you, but I feel like I was just taken to school uh, and, uh, and and a lot there to process. And uh, certainly, as a parent, I found myself reflecting on my kids uh, a lot throughout that, and uh, and can connect with pretty much everything that he said, uh, all of the mistakes and, and all of that, and uh, had, had, had my fair share. Uh, quick side note, yesterday I put together a basketball goal with my kids. And um, you want to you wanna invite an opportunity to be a bad dad? That's probably it. Uh, and so, Sam, I'm sorry, because uh, I know that I lost my cool more than once in that endeavor. Uh, but the end result was good. Uh, and so, uh, but could connect with all of that. But here's, here's what, here's what struck me the most. And maybe, maybe you can relate to this. I love the story from the Bible that you shared that you connected with that because as it relates to trauma, the wealth that you and I have is you and I course our relationship with Jesus and you see we can we can squander the truth of the relationship that we have with another and potentially cause more trauma in their life or we can step into the void we can step into the gap and be the very thing that that person needs and I think that's the beauty of how God designed all of us because I don't know about you, but when I find myself wound up and anxious and stressed and even walking through traumatic experiences myself, there is nothing like my wife putting her hand on my shoulder, putting a hand on the knee. Just that physical touch can bring healing into my life. Especially knowing that in that moment, she could look at me and say, just get over it, Tim, and do nothing. And it's how God has wired us, isn't it? That in the context of relationship, we can be each other's hurt or we can be each other's help. But we've got to lean into that, don't we? And oh, how easy it is to turn a blind eye to go in the other direction, to ignore. Because, church, the, the biggest revelation of Jesus that can come into a person's life is often through you and me. And so as I think about my children and my wife, the relationships that I have, the friends that I interact with, as I personally think about all of you. I want to see the wealth that he's deposited in me, not for my benefit, but for your benefit. And share that wealth with every person that I come in contact with. And that wealth, church, if you didn't catch it, it's the list that we saw. It's the warm eyes. It's the encouraging comment. It's the redo even. Oh, come on, church, how we need to give people redos in our lives. It's being in the heat of the moment and taking that pause and not reacting because of something selfish inside of us, but reacting generously towards the other person. And so I, myself at least, I found myself reflecting on the fact that I am wealth to another person. Not because of anything I've done, but because of what God has done in me. And man, if we just lived that out, our world would change, wouldn't it? We're going to sing another song. I can't even really remember what it is. Yeah, that's perfect. JD, man. In a couple weeks... I, I love what you shared because in a couple of weeks we're going to start a new series. And the series is called Radical. And we're going to spend a few weeks just simply looking at the teachings of Jesus. 
because I think we've lost our way in connecting with those very important words from Scripture. We need to reconnect ourselves with those words, those directives, those challenges that we see from Jesus himself. And what we saw today, you guys know this was a story given by Jesus, right? This is Jesus recounting this story, telling this story. These are the words of Jesus, and basically he's communicating to me and you that, hey, you're rich beyond your wildest dreams. And it's up to you whether you're going to use those riches according to his kingdom or your kingdom. And so, as we get ready to sing this song, I want to encourage you to just reflect on the relationships in your life. Maybe you know someone who has had some very traumatic things happen to them. And you simply need to reach out to them. Send them a text. Give them a call. Invite them out to lunch. Maybe you yourself struggle with trauma. Because of the words we heard today, we've been invited to say, I need some help. (laughs) And so use this message and say, you know, I heard somebody speak today on this, and I just want to let you know that you're one of my dearest friends, and man, I could really use a coffee with you this week. Because it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. Because you and I, we are each other's wealth. So let's invest, let's deposit in each other. Not because of us, because of what he's done. Stand to your feet and let's worship him together. You were the word at the beginning And one with God the in glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven down My sin was great, your love was greater And what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is What a wonderful name it is name it is and nothing compares to this what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus what a wonderful name it is the name of Jesus cause death could not hold you the veil tore before you Silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again, and you have no rival, and you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. And 
yours is the kingdom and yours is the glory and yours is the name above all names because death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again and you have no rival and you have no equal and now and forever God you reign and yours is the kingdom and yours is the glory and yours is the name above all names and what a powerful name it is and what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King and what a powerful name it is and nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We're so thankful for our relationship with you and how you, how you make so clear to us our role in this world. It's my prayer that today and this week that each of us would see the wealth you've deposited in us and take steps to connect with others who are hurting and who need us. And God, for those of us that felt uh, a sense of, uh, of something being opened up in us, maybe a pain or a hurt, God, I pray that, Lord, not only would, would you touch us there and bring healing to us, but God, that we might see the next step that we need to take in order to be fully healed. We thank you for the truth of your word and just to be able to worship you here today. Lord, we thank you for the Spencers. Lord, we pray blessing and favor on them. God, we pray that you would continue to work in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just a couple last things before the blessing. First, don't forget, you can text your questions in. Jeff, do you mind putting that slide back up on the screen for us? Text your questions in. would love to have several questions to be able to ask our panel. I think there's like maybe seven or eight of you guys coming. It's awesome. Uh, and so let's, let's, uh, let's give them plenty of things to answer. Uh, but also, uh, again, I'll mention, maybe you've uh, sensed that you need to take some further steps. And I just want to tell you that Care to Change is a great organization. And, uh, and, and you can call there and set up an appointment to talk to somebody. And I want to encourage you, if, if, if at all you feel that tug, please take that step. Uh, that is what they're there for. If you need to talk with me and uh, before you take that step, please do that as well. Uh, but just want to encourage you because this entire series is about healing. It's about healing from the things that have hurt you. Uh, and, and then responding to others who have been hurt. And so I want to encourage you, uh, if that's you, to take that step. Take it very seriously. And now the blessing, if you'll receive it this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace as you take steps to heal and to help others heal. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Sunday. What a power.